Ambassador Ledoux Gubeck is a teacher, journalist, public speaker, human rights, civil rights activist, community and a political organizer. He's a financial educator. He's a published poet and playwright. He was born in 1974 in South Sudan, and he lost his eyesight to measles and became totally blind at the age of 10. He spent his entire adult life fighting for the rights of many who needed a burden lifted and barriers removed because it is his fundamental belief that freedom is the birthright of every human being. Um, Ledoux has served as chairman of the Sudan, Sudan People's Liberation Movement of the United States, the chairperson of Southern Sudan Referendum Task Force USA, president of the Equatorian South Sudanese Community Association, the National Salvation Front, the diplomatic representative to the United States and the United Nations, and commissioner of the Bloomington Human Rights Commission. Uh, Ledoux is currently the president and CEO of the Minnesota Financial Education Center in Bloomington, Minnesota. So I'm really looking forward to hearing from him since I heard his background. And we welcome you to Bloomington Noon Rotary. Thank you, thank you so very much uh, for that warm welcome. Um, you know, I came uh, to Rotary the first time, Karen invited me as a guest. I think it was a few years ago, and uh, it's an, a, you know, a great, <laughs> great organization that is doing a lot of work, you know, in advancing the cause of peace uh, throughout the world. Um, yes, I, my name is Ladu Gobek, as mentioned. Um, I came to the United States 26 years ago, um, you know, as a refugee from then the war torn Sudan before, you know, the, the two countries split. Um, you know, went to University of Minnesota and, you know, um, got married in 2005 um, and, and now have four beautiful children. Uh, the oldest is in, you know, from, from six to 17, so you can imagine how busy the household is. <laughs> We've been a great, great neighbors to uh, my dear friend Karen uh, for nearly nine years now. So, so uh, she's, she's basically uh, the dictionary, my dictionary in Bloomington. If I need anything, I call her, <laughs> including, of course, when the light goes out. <laughs> <laughs> so yes, thank you very much. Uh, it's, uh, it's, it's truly an honor to uh, to be to be here. Um, Nelson Mandela once said, um, "There is no passion to be found uh, playing small and settling for life that is less than you are capable of living." Uh, ten years, you know, into my life, when I was ten years old. Um, you know, I lost my sight to measles, uh, you know, and totally, you know, became blind. Um, that, of course, you know, threw my life upside down. Uh, in, and in South Sudan and probably in most of the African countries, uh, blindness is associated with, you know, helplessness, hopelessness, you know, dependency and inferiority. Um, you know, the misconceptions and the stereotypes that exist uh, in the public minds uh, about, about blindness uh, was real. Uh, I suffered isolation and despair, um, you know, rejection um, and discrimination, uh, not only by the general public, uh, but also uh, by my own uh, family. 
my father, who was the husband of five wives and a father of uh, quite a bit of children, made it very clear through his actions that there was no time you know, to, or, or resources to be wasted on a blind child. Uh, my mother loved me, but she didn't know what to do. Um, so I spent two years uh, you know, of isolation and despair. Um, and after two years, I discovered uh, that there was a blindness training center. Um, you know, whereby they trained, uh, you know, rehabilitate, I would say, uh, you know, blind persons uh, to learn basic skills uh, of daily living. It was then that I learned Braille. Um, and after spending the nine months at that Rajaf Educational Center, that was, in fact, uh, the center was founded by the Norwegian uh, Church Aid. Uh, and NAP, um, you know, BP. And of course, it was after then, then now, what is the next journey for me? I decided uh, that settling for, for life that was less than I was capable of living was not a choice. Uh, you know, I had a fundamental choice to make. Uh, you know, whether to accept the stereotypes, the stereotypes that was imposed uh, on me by the society, uh, that, you know, blindness was probably the end of life, uh, or to fight uh, for, my, for my future and my, my own freedom. So I decided to go to uh, the, the school, the primary school. Um, it was quite, you know, it was a Catholic school. And of course, there was no primary school, uh, there was no elementary school, nor any school of, of any kind, um, you know, uh, for the blind uh, back in South Sudan then. So I told him I wanted to become part of the school. Um, he told me, why don't you stay home and wait until, you know, when the students come and you will, you know, you will ask them what they learned. I said, but that's not, you know, education for me. I wanted to be a part of the school system. Um, so I explained to him that I can take notes in Braille and the teachers could ask me questions and I could answer orally uh, in the exams. And I was given three days as a trial period, uh, realizing that I was already past two weeks in school. So I went back to the headmaster and asked him, you gave me three days, but I'm now here for two weeks. And he said, well, uh, you surprised all of us, and now you have to pay the school fees, and you have to come in a school uniform. Uh, one problem is solved, but now I have another problem. So I went to my father and said, I needed the school fees and, and uniform, and he said, to do what? I said, well, to be a student, a uh, student to do what? And of course, to be educated, and so what after education? So he refused. So by the end of the day, I found a Samaritan that was able to pay my school fees and uh, got me uniform. And you know, I was able to now proceed and pave the way for so many uh, blind people that were after me. Then the war broke out uh, in South Sudan. Um, it was. Uh, uh, basically a war in the entire Sudan, uh, a war um, that was among the Sudanese themselves. Uh, it was an ideological war. Um, it was a struggle between uh, the Islamic and the Christian ideologies. Um, and the politicians had exploited, um, you know, Islam for their own favor, to interpret Quran that a non-Muslim, a Muslim cannot be governed by a non-Muslim. And therefore, if you are Christian in the Sudan, you had no hope of becoming president of that country. You have to be submitted to junior positions. Uh, you know, Christian churches uh, were burned down and shut down, so most Christians were forcefully converted uh, into Islam. Uh, later on, when I moved to Khartoum, 
uh, for further studies, uh, I joined uh, the you know, group of young people resisting uh, forceful conversion into Islam, uh, which uh, later on led into an attempt on my life, and I had to flee the Sudan uh, in 1994 uh, and became a refugee in Ethiopia. Uh, spending three years in Ethiopia, I you know, got the opportunity to become uh, a refugee uh, you know, through the Refugee Resettlement Program to be resettled in the United States. Um, and of course, it opened so many doors for me uh, because it was here uh, that I joined the National Federation of the Blind, an organized blind movement that was fighting for the rights of the blind for so many years. But for me, blindness uh, was an issue but it has now become part of my life. And I now have to fight the larger, uh, the, the larger battle for human rights and civil rights. Uh, so we organized, lobbied the United States Congress, um, and with the help of uh, President Bush in 2005, um, Sudan Peace Act was signed into law, uh, the US Congress, um, which led and path the way to the comprehensive peace agreement in the whole of Sudan, um, which gave South Sudan a local autonomy and the right for self-determination in six years, in, which was 2011. Uh, so I was fortunate to become the chairperson of South Sudan Referendum Task Force, organizing South Sudanese citizens in the United States into eight different zones, um, you know, to be able to vote for their right of self-determination. Uh, and in 2008, uh, 2011, uh, on July the 9th, um, South Sudanese raised their flag as an independent state, uh, becoming the world 193rd country. Um, it became the sense of pride uh, and the sense of relief and freedom uh, to many because the fundamental freedoms that they have been fighting for uh, the time has now come to be exercised. But two years into the independence, my friends, we were surprised uh, because the liberators turned uh, to be oppressors of their own people. Uh, the president had privatized the military, and the military started uh, carrying out arbitrary arrest. Uh, of journalists, of uh, you know, opposition leaders, of activists of human rights, uh, you know, uh, rampant corruption, uh, you know, uh, forceful rape of women, uh, you know, abused uh, of, the, of the system, and that led into the war uh, in 2013, um, you know, between the two major tribes, the Nuer and the Dinka. Uh, from that time, South Sudan has never become the same. Uh, there was an agreement that was uh, signed uh, briefly, and then it led also into another war in 2016. Um, up to today, as we speak, uh, South Sudan is engulfed into terrible bloodshed uh, throughout the country. Um, human rights uh, abuses are so rampant. Uh, you know, injustices against the system, corrupt public resources are squandered uh, for personal good. Um, and uh, above all, uh, you know, the future of our, of our nation, the little children are deprived of basic education. Um, the healthcare system uh, is terrible. Uh, people die prematurely. Uh, or, you know, diseases that could be key or keyword or prevented. Um, and, you know, they talk of elections and elections, elections have been postponed uh, from time to time. So, um, you know, it's another struggle. Uh, it's another struggle for, uh, for many, um, you know, in South Sudan who are fighting for, uh, you know, for, for freedom and for independence. Um, and the United States has given us that opportunity. 
uh, you know, to be able to, you know, based on the democratic values, uh, you know, to, to uh, you know, to organize and advance, uh, you know, advance peace uh, in so many, uh, so many areas. Um, but the fundamental belief, uh, the fundamental question that I uh, quite often ask myself is, you know, is life really, you know, about what you settle for? Um, you know, is it, is it about what you have achieved? Um, is, it, is it about you as an individual who may have a food on the table, have a roof on, on your head? You know, you, you know, my kids in the United States of America are in, you know, going to better school systems, living in you know, safe neighborhood, and, you know, I'm able to, um, to work for them. But their struggle within me is quite often, um, how about the rest of the people around the world? Um, you know, whether they're in India, whether they're in parts of, you know, other parts of Asia, whether they're in Africa, or even here in the United States of America, people who still struggle. Uh, they still struggle with, you know, um, economic, uh, you know, issues, upward, issues of upward mobility, how to move up uh, in the system. People who struggle with lack of proper education. Uh, you know, you people who still struggle due to lack of, you know, respect for human and women rights. Uh, people who still struggle, you know, for clean water. You know, quite often they are not able to find clean water. Clean water is not, um, you know, something they can dream of. Um, subjecting them to series of diseases and, uh, of course, premature death. You know, how about those who struggle uh, in, in injustices in the hands of their government? Uh, you know, quite often, uh, you know, uh, in solitary confinement, in, in prisons and jail. You know, journalists who put their lives up on this, you know, um, on behalf of others. So life, by the end of the day, becomes what, are you, what is life for? And by the end of the day, who are you? And I ask myself quite often, who am I? You know, who am I? You know, am I, you know, a person who, this blind man who now is struggled for his own personal freedom, ended up fighting the larger war for, you know, human rights and civil rights in different parts of the world? Um, am I a, just a father or a proud husband or a humble father? Uh, but by the end of the day, I came to believe you know, that I am just a spiritual being, you know, in a human form, trying to, you know, do um, God's will, uh, trying to do, um, advance the cause of peace, the cause of freedom. You know, by the end of the day, you know, I as a human being, I'm just a mirror, you know, on which, which God's works can really be, um, you know, achieved. Uh, you know, what am I, who am I? Uh, you know, uh, you hoping to be a candle that can now l give light at the darkest corners of the of the earth. You know, but above all, I think I'm um, just a child and a servant of God. You know, trying to advance God's kingdom, uh, God's kingdom on earth. So, for many, uh, sometimes when you ask yourself, you know, how much time do I have on this earth? Is it 50 more years? Is it 20 more years? You know, five more years? And the issue is, when the time comes, you realize even the strongest bones that you have in your physical body, the time will come that they would even dissolve. But what is it that you can live on this earth? What is it that, that can live on? Uh, and, and, and I believe is, is, is when you find that meaning, that you can leave legacy, a uh, legacy of peace, and legacy of human rights, a legacy of women's rights, legacy of civil rights, 
uh, you know, you leave this world a better place than, than you found. And quite often, for many, they, they use the darkest spots of their life, the scars on their, you know, on their body, their hearts, on their mind as an excuse. But, you know, let there be no excuse, you know, for you uh, to succeed in life. You know, for me, I never use my blindness uh, to be an excuse, uh, excuse, as an excuse to be nobody, but rather as a strong reason uh, to be somebody. Um, and, and that's uh, really what's in life. You know, I, do you choose to be a winner uh, in this life? Uh, and do you choose to have a legacy um, by helping others? or it is just about yourself. But by the end of the day, this world is above you, is above I, uh, but it is about what you can leave. It is the mark, the strongest mark that you can leave as, as a legacy. So thank you very much uh, for inviting me to, to speak with you and to share with you my beliefs and my stories of struggle uh, against injustices and against, uh, you know, uh, the uh, oppression uh, and against suppression and against human rights violations with you today. So uh, I'm glad to take questions. You've done any. Thank you very much. Okay. Yes. Um, I will call on people that have questions for you. And the first one is from your neighbor, All right. Fern Nordstrom. <laughs> yeah, sure. Um, do you want to tell them a little bit about your rather new business? Oh, yes, yes. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Karen, uh, for, for, for that. Uh, one of the things that I, um, you know, throughout, um, you know, my life, um, you know, quite often doing human rights and political work, political organizing and community work, um, but I came to realize um, that really the problem um, you know, the real issue quite often uh, that people struggle with is lack of financial literacy. Uh, you'll, you know, find people can work two, three jobs. You know, even those who are doctors in, you know, in their life or engineers, when it comes to retirement, sometimes they struggle. And, and you find somebody who is financially educated you know, was just a simple plumber, but can be, can live a better retirement. And so the issue is really not how much you have earned, uh, but the issue is, uh, you know, what do you do with what you have earned? Uh, you know, how much, um, you know, how much can you save? How much can you plan? Um, and especially in the immigrant community, I found that the struggle um, is, is, you know, for upward mobility, economic mobility, is because of lack of education. You know, they work two, three jobs, they don't, even don't have time for their children, but quite often they even don't have, they resist the concept of even life insurance. Like in our community, for example, if we tell somebody about life insurance, they say, are you trying to tell me, are you trying to kill me? Are you trying to predict my death? You know? Because they don't have that concept of life insurance. And quite often, when crisis strikes in the community, death happens. You know, somebody who has no life insurance will have a will that when I die, I want to be taken to South Sudan. My remains will be taken to South Sudan. And now the community is forced to do GoFundMe, to raise money to send that body back home. But the, the worst thing is not even burying that person. The worst thing is, what happens to that family when the breadwinner is gone? Quite often they lose their home, they, you know, children become school dropout, uh, you know, and stuff like that. So last year I, you know, uh, joined a new venture, uh, you know, become a financial educator, um, you know, I'm with World Financial Group and World System Builder and often the Minnesota Financial Education Center in Bloomington. Uh, whereby we do, we have seven workshops that we conduct on Zoom and, uh, you know, libraries and churches and mosques and, you know, people homes. 
workshop number one is on building savings and wealth, you know, teaching people about the wealth formula. Um, workshop two is about increasing your cash flow and managing your debt. Workshop three is preparing with proper protection. Uh, how to protect the most important asset of your life. And quite often when I ask people, what is your asset? They said, oh, my children, my car, my home. And I said, no, those are not your asset. Your asset is really your ability to generate income. If that asset is taken away from you, if you cannot work, what's going to happen to your family? You know, what's going to happen to the income that you bring? You know, and the fourth workshop is on well, uh, health and, and wealth. And the fifth workshop is understanding asset accumulation strategies. And the sixth one is fulfilling your long-term goals. And the seventh workshop is optimizing your social security benefits. So um, those are the workshops that we, that we conduct. We are uh, also a financial consulting firm. Uh, you know, we, uh, you know, we do you know, financial investments, annuities, um, partners with Athen Global and other um, investments companies. Um, different life insurance products like in, uh, universal index life, uh, which comes almost three in, in one, um, and, and business insurances and some other things. Yeah, so that's the, the new passion that I, you know, really become. But I, I have traveled to, you know, probably since I've started to, you know, over 20 or 30 states doing presentations, um, you know, these workshops, you know, making sure that our people are, the people are really educated on, you know, on their finances and be able to, you know, serve long term, find ways of how they can plan for college saving instead of burdening their kids with, with loans that they cannot, um, you know, uh, dig themselves out of. So that's uh, uh, that's that's what I do now, um, uh, you know, for, for for a year now. Okay, let's see if we have other questions, Eldon. Yes, I have a couple of questions, uh, both related to that financial literacy point as it affects immigrant communities. First question relates to adults, second to children. As far as the adults, um, I noticed none of the seven seminars that are offered focuses on scams, whether they be romance scams or elder scams or whatever, uh, that affect all communities, but I would just, but do they have particular types of scams that are directed to immigrants with less financial sophistication, uh, you know, through the internet or otherwise? And as far as the children, I'm thinking of the bill that the legislature passed last year requiring financial literacy classes for all students in the state. Um, is there, can you think of ways that perhaps you or people in your position could assist people implementing that program in focusing on any aspects of financial literacy that might be more unique or specialized for immigrant communities or the children of immigrant communities. Yes, and that's and that's what we do. We actually, I'm I'm actually reaching out to adult community, uh, you know, adult, uh, uh, you know, basic education centers, and and and, and so many areas trying to. Uh, trying to, you know, make sure that this education is brought to, um, even during, you know, even so many uh, libraries who are trying to, to reach out and do this, you know, these presentations. Um, because the challenge is now, uh, quite often there are so many uh, products out there and, and, and quite often they go to some financial advisors, even if they have, the, you know, little money that they want to invest. But you know, quite often they're not even educated about the money. They, they, they're not educated about, about the concept of saving. And, and so many of them are you know, really buried in so much debt. Credit cards you know, becomes their own um, emergency fund. And, 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 and that's really you know, the case. And they don't know that the interest also would double on that. Um, but, but I think uh, you know, quite often, um, you know, like those who lack the language, it is also the issue because now um, children who are supposed to be getting direction from parents are now directing the parents on what to do. And, and, and they, you know, with, uh, at that young age, not knowing enough, that, you know, that becomes really the, uh, the problem. Uh, and, and I think the issue that 
we face is really uh, you know, the foundational issue. Because most immigrants, especially when you come here as, you know, uh, as refugees, you come uh, without proper education on financial literacy and you know, understanding the country, you, know, you go to work right away. That's the first thing you, know, you do to be able to, to take care of your family. And quite often, the pay is not good for you to sustain, you know, for one job to sustain your family. So quite often, you have to work two, three jobs working, you know, and you come, you come, you come from work and your wife is leaving to, to go to work. And, and preventing, really, these immigrants from, from, from getting the necessary education um, that would now help them, you know, build the American dream. And, and that's why they struggle. And because of lack of education, they're not even able to direct the kids. You know, what do the kids do? And instead of finishing high school, sometimes quite often they don't finish high school, then they go back to work at those companies that their parents work. And so it becomes a cycle of struggle, a cycle of poverty, cycle of scarcity, and a cycle of struggle from one generation to the other. And that is the you know, cycle of struggle that we have to break, you know, for at least the, the, the next generation, you know, the children that were, are born here uh, to be able to, you know, to live the American dream. And anything about um, scams that are financial scams that are directed at immigrant populations? So many, so many. You will have, you know, somebody will call you, or oh, you know, there are uh, these deals. Um, you know, you can, if, if, you, if you pay one thousand dollars, this one thousand dollars every month will earn you five thousand dollars. Of course, with the struggle you are in, you don't have the money, but you can go borrow that one thousand dollars, because. You know, you are, you are told that this $1,000 can earn you 5000 can earn you 10000 and you are told that it will double. In one year, you could become a millionaire. And quite often, after taking that money, you know, uh, they might wipe up your, uh, your bank account, and, and, and they're nowhere to be found. Even the, the, the telephone numbers they call you from, when you call back, they're no, they're no longer there to be found. So it's really the, the, the desperate situation that lets people to, to fall into these scams. And there's so, so many you know, uh, scams um, uh, out there. Uh, some of them are probably even overseas. You, know, you hear people with different accents you know, calling you. Some of them are saying they're from London, they're this company, some of them are here. So that is really what the, um, you know, the American uh, legal system really needs to crack down. Because they're preying on these, you know, poor, you know, uh, immigrants who don't even have enough to live on, and now the little that they have is being is stolen from them. Thank you. Um, another question, Kurt. Yes, first, thank you for sharing your story. It's very inspiring, and I think, you know, of all the uh, discrimination you've been through, I think the hardest one for me would have been by your own family. And I'm curious, it, was there ever reconciliation with your father? Or, how did things end with your mother when you came to the U.S.? Yes, yeah, thank you. I think that's, that's, that's an important question. Um, I was uh, quite, uh, you know, bitter with my father uh, growing up and, uh, you know, was not really happy. I didn't, I didn't have a good relationship with him because uh, I, I really felt like, you know, I felt abundant. You know, I felt like, you know, unwanted, uh, you know, unwanted child in the family. Um, you know, and quite often my success came from many others um, who, you know, had felt um, something extraordinary in me and they, you know, uh, people in society, quite often people I don't know um, that have reached out to help, uh, to make, you know, who made me who I am today. Um, so when I was in Ethiopia, um, uh, you know, at that time I think it was, uh, you know, I was 20 years old. Um, I was struggling, uh, you know, with, with anger, uh, struggling with, with anger, struggling with frustration and resentment towards my father and towards my family. Uh, but I came to uh, to conclusion um, that I had to, to forgive my father. Uh, it was not by design or it was not his intention that he didn't want to help me. He just didn't know better. You know, he was just, you know, he was just ignorant of the situation. 
because you know, because of the society, it is the societal misconceptions and the stereotypes that, you know, if you are blind, somebody will tell you flat on your face that it is better to die than to, you know, to live blind. And so it was because of the society. So I came to, to you know, to conclusion that I had to, I had to forgive my father. And I, I wrote him a very long letter, uh, you know, citing all the instances, all the things that he did against me, or, you know, all the, um, you know, his attitude towards me and his, uh, how he, you know, was not, you know, refused to pay my school fees and, you know, and everything. And, 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 you know, narrated to, you know, in the letter how I felt as a child. I, I never felt that, you know, he, I'm, I'm really his child. Um, you know, there were, there were times I asked myself whether I was really, you know, my father's child. Uh, and, and quite often, uh, did, there were some questions where I asked myself, you know, whether it was really worth living, you know, with all the, uh, the suffering uh, and the resistance in the society, you know. And, and I decided after telling him everything and my bitterness, I told him, you know, as if I had predicted the future. I said, I realize and I have the feeling that tomorrow I am going to be the person who will take care of you. And you are my father, I have forgiven you for everything you, you, know, you have done against me, uh, and I love you. And it was, that was in 1994 when I came to Ethiopia. Um, so when I came to the United States, I you know, started reaching out and you know, meeting, you know, t t talking to them on the phone. Uh, and in 2003, I decided, uh, you know, I was invited um, to give a lecture at the African Literature Association Conference at, at the University of Alexandria in, in Egypt. Mm -hmm. So I decided to invite my father and my mother uh, to come to Cairo, Egypt. Uh, I spent five weeks with them. Uh, talking to them on you know every day and confronting my father face to face about you know the things that he did um, and telling him that you know since he you know but back then he had still little more children uh, from other wives so I was telling him I don't want any of my siblings my any of my you know my brothers and sisters from other mothers to go through what I went through. You know, you have to be a father of all, you have to, you know, kids are given to you by God, and, and therefore you have to, you know, for me I am, you know, uh, you know, I have lived that suffering, and now I've forgiven you. I want, I want you to, you know, in the rest years of your life, to be a better father. Um, and since then he, you know, he suffered so many, you know, illness, there were time, if I didn't rush him to India, he would have died. I have rushed him to India, rushed him to so many countries to save his life, uh, you know. So, uh, I am, I would say, uh, the best child he would consider today. <laughs> but but uh, the saddest part was that I, you know, after meeting my mother in person in 2003, um, in 2006, even when my daughter was still, my firstborn was three, years, three months old, um, there was a calling uh, from the United States government calling on South Sudanese professionals to go and help establish the government of South Sudan, especially in the field of healthcare and education. And I volunteered uh, you know, through the United States Agency for International Development to go and work in South Sudan for six months to establish um, you know, uh, educational system that is geared towards, uh, you know, people with special needs. Um, because I, I felt that could, is the best contribution I can ever do uh, for my people and for that kind of young country that was establishing. But actually the reason that compelled me to leave my three months daughter uh, here to go home was yes, one, to help that young nation but also to go and spend a lot of time with my mother, uh, who struggled, um, you know, with 
you know, a blind child who wanted the best for him, but didn't know what to do. Um, I traveled to South Sudan. Uh, my mother knew that I was coming. She was excited. Uh, but unfortunately, the day I arrived in Juba, I was surprised to the sad news that my mother was just buried. She died suddenly and, um, you know, so never had the chance to, to spend that time with her other than meeting her in Cairo in 2003. Uh, but uh, as a son, I was able to give her the honorable uh, burial, the honorable funeral um, required, you know, the honor of the mother. Um, and, and, you know, although I was not able to spend time with her, uh, but, you know, uh, I, was, I was happy and that I was there to, to give her that honor uh, and dignity as the mother. One last question. Does anybody else have a last question? Yes. What are the major tribes and languages in South Sudan? <laughs> Well, South Sudan consists of uh, at least 64 tribes. And um, the major tribes that uh, you hear of are Dinka tribe, where the current president hails from, uh, the Nuer tribe, where the current first vice president hails from. You know, South Sudan has five vice presidents. Uh, one is the first vice president, the rest are called vice, vice, vice presidents. Um, but uh, there are so many. You have the Bari tribe, where you know it is the capital. Uh, is in, you know the people who inherit the indigenous to Juba, the capital of South Sudan, and so many tribes. Uh, you know, 64 tribes, and therefore because of the complexity um, of tribes and ethnic groups, uh, you find the tension is very high. If I am a minister today, and I am removed from power. All my tribes will now, you know, rally up against the system because, you know, their son, uh, who is the source of, of their income from the government, is now taken away. Uh, and if I am the president, like the president today, who is a Dinka, now the Dinka feel entitled, um, and, and that's the source of conflict and bloodshed uh, because in 2013, they felt that the vice president, who was Nuer, Dr. Yagmashar, uh, was eyeing for the presidency. And that's why there was a conflict. Uh, the Nuer were massacred in Juba. 20,000 Nuer were actually innocent blood were killed in Juba because uh, what is a tribe versus the other. Um, so once you own the power, your tribe felt that is, their, that is the power they have to protect because that is the only, you know, economic, uh, you know, uh, lifeline. Um, and therefore, the issue of tribe is what affects the country. And until and unless South Sudan rises above the tribal and ethnic uh, divisions to embrace the sense of nationalism, I think South Sudan, in my view, is not yet a state. We can't thank you enough for the education that you've given us all today. <laughs> and so we so appreciate that. Thank and you. Um, also for you being part of our Bloomington community. So I just want to thank you very much for coming to speak. Uh, thank you. <laughs> thank you, thank you. All right.